Hey guys, hope you're having a great day. We've been talking about family and finances over the past few episodes, and we're going to be wrapping it up today with another great conversation about financial literacy and teaching our children about money. But before I get into our conversation today and introduce our guest, I wanted to throw out a quick update. Hopefully you've already listened to our last two episodes on helping to teach our children about money. If you haven't yet checked those out, make sure and do that. They were both great conversations. And after those, I felt motivated myself to buy both authors' books and have my children read them. And I wanted to give you a quick update on that. So the first book we received was David Delisle's book, The Golden Quest, Your Journey to a Rich Life. So I read it, my older son read it, and we just finished reading it to my middle son. They both completely gobbled it up. My older son read it in one sitting and my middle son, who's seven, and I read it over three or four bedtime stories. He kept wanting to continue reading like after one or two chapters, even though it was past his bedtime. So it was definitely really engaging for both of them. I think this is going to be a fantastic book, especially for children who've never explored money topics. I think the ideal age range is probably like maybe six to 10 years old. It's very visual and has like an engaging storyline and conveys some really solid money lessons. But I think the most important thing to point out is this book does a great job sprinkling in some super important financial principles, which I think are the foundation of using money as a tool to achieve happiness. I think a lot of adults really are missing these principles. And so this book teaches this concept of the fact that less material stuff is more and to be really aware of spending and view spending decisions from the lens of will I really love and use this material thing. It also teaches kids to save first before spending and make sure and put the savings to work by investing. And then one concept I think that's really missing in society is this concept of giving. This book teaches children that giving actually makes them richer. And then the final lesson helps reinforce this idea of saving first by talking about how the real value of having money is its ability to buy you time and freedom to do what's truly most important. Really, I think a lot of adults could benefit from reading this, and certainly kids can. So the second book we received was Will Rainey's book, Grandpa's Fortune Fables, Fun Stories to Teach Kids About Money. So I read this and my oldest son is almost done with it. So this book is a little bit more advanced than The Golden Quest, but not a lot. I would say it's great for probably like maybe seven years old and older. I'll try reading it with my seven-year-old son to see, but this, this book covers all the things that were covered in The Golden Quest and really hits on a lot more topics. It's, it's a little bit longer of a book. It's less visual, of course. It's, you know, the fable format. It's more like stories, written stories, and less like, you know, visual pictures. But this book covers a lot of topics like, you know, that weren't covered in the Golden Quest, like starting a business, managing debt, taxes, avoiding get-rich-quick schemes, working smarter, not harder, and the risks of investing. So the method of teaching is great. I love the, the fables as a method, and I think that really catches kids' attention. And of course, like the Golden Quest, this book sprinkles in some super important concepts as well, like the difference between being rich and wealthy and how more is not always better. It also teaches this really important lesson that anybody can become wealthy even if they come from a tough upbringing. Every chapter also ends with this lesson learned and throws out some simple questions to consider. So I think this book would be a great book for a child that, that has already so, shown some interest in money, and I think there's going to be a ton of takeaways and questions that, that they raise after reading it. So since reading these, my sons have brought up saving, giving, and have asked questions about investing, and they've asked how to make money or what to do with the money. I've set them up since then to, you know, on projects to make money. And my older son, we've set him up to, to actually sell some of our old stuff that we're not using on eBay. And he's going to be making like a 30% cut on it. And so he's kind of like starting his own little tiny business on it. And so, but in general, like they brought up money and some of these concepts like investing more than they ever have before. And it's, I think a lot of it's been prompted by these books. So it's, this is really effective stuff. I would definitely recommend both books if you have kids in this age range. By the way, I'm not like accepting commissions for recommending these books in case you're wondering. I just genuinely think they're great. 
and I'm really excited to be able to share those with you. So I'm excited also to get into today's show, so let's let's jump into that now. So my guest today is a mom, a wife, she's a dentist, she's a fellow personal finance geek, she's an entrepreneur and a coach, so she's got a lot going on. She's also an author of a children's book on money. That's three guest authors in a row who have written children's books on, which is crazy because I didn't know there was really any. And so I'm so excited to be able to find some really good content, not only for adults, but also for kids. So along the way of becoming a dentist, and as she started to pay off some of this massive student loan debt she had, our guest today realized that many in medicine don't have a solid foundation and need help. This motivated her to start Doctors Out of Debt, to help coach other doctors on how to tackle debt and gain financial freedom. She found through this experience that many doctors have never really absorbed or been taught some of these basic personal finance concepts. And that really where the issue is, is in childhood. So in seeing all this, it motivated her to take the initiative to write and publish a children's book designed to help parents begin talking about money with their kiddos. So my guest today is Dr. Caroline Clarisme. We had a great conversation, and so we talked about a lot of different things. We talked about how she paid off $250,000 in four years. You know, that's a pretty impressive feat in itself. We talked about why financial literacy is one of the greatest gifts we can pass on to our children. We talked about how and when we can bring up this topic with our children. And then we talked about why a book like hers is such a great catalyst for the conversation. So as I mentioned, great conversation. I think I really think you're going to enjoy this one. And let's jump right into it. Caroline, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited for our conversation today. I know you got lots of good nuggets to share and you have a lot of different things going on with your, of course, with your dental practice, but also with your business and helping people pay off debt. And you've even written a children's book and there's all kinds of good stuff you got going on that I, I think will be great to talk about. Maybe before we get into some of that, I would love it if you could kind of share a little bit about how you got into helping doctors to pay off debt. I think that's such an interesting business in itself, but like, how did you get to this point of helping other people pay off debt? Absolutely. Again, so I'm a general dentist in New Hampshire, and I'm sure you guys can hear an accent. And yes, I'm from Haiti, but I'm in New Hampshire, where it's very, very cold right now. But anyway, general dentist in New Hampshire. I'm also a wife, mother to a toddler, and I am a co-author of an amazing, amazing book, Lily and the Talking Piggy Bank, Let's Learn About Money. And I'm also the founder and CEO of Doctors Out of Debt, where I help doctors to create generational wealth and get out of debt at the same time. And the reason all that happened is that when I graduated from dental school a long time ago, well, like 11 years ago, <laughs> I had a lot of debt. I had about $250,000 of student loans. And coming from the Caribbean where growing up, we, I didn't really have any exposure to credit, student loans, or any of that. And I'm like, $250,000 of student loans? It's a big <laughs> number. Like, but... By applying a bunch of debt repayment strategies, I was able to pay everything off in four years with a starting salary of less than six figures. And shortly after, I was able to go from one stream of income to seven streams of income. And I just really started talking to doctors about what I've been doing. And before I know it, I'm the founder of Doctors Out of Debt, where I'm really showing doctors how I was able to do that to be able to get out of there quickly and starting creating wealth at the same time. And from that, Lily and the Talking Piggy Bank was pretty much born because I realized that after talking to so many doctors that a lot of money habits were learned from early on, from when they were kids. So I'm like, the sooner the better that they can talk about that, that their parents can talk about that, meaning children, the better. 
So that's why the book has been a success. Everybody loves it, loves it because they get to talk about something that has been so taboo. So a lot of the doctors you have been working with, have you noticed that a lot of them maybe haven't had some of these foundational money lessons, even as an adult? Absolutely. And I must say that money is still taboo. And that's something that we use every single day. And mm -hmm. we still don't like talking about it. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Yes. And I must say, growing up, our parents talked to us openly about money. And here I am thinking with everybody talks about money openly. And then we're like, oh, we don't do that here. <laughs> so even in college and dental school, even after dental school, I realized that we don't talk about money. It's like, shh, don't talk about it. And of course, that's a problem because... If you don't talk about it, if you don't know your numbers, if you don't know how to improve your numbers, if you don't talk about investing or getting out of debt, you will still feel like you're in a bubble. You don't know how to mm -hmm. pretty much get to the other side. Yeah. I would have to hope that people went the direction of not talking about money with good intentions. I think people worry about hurting other people's feelings about like talking about their money and they don't want to come across as like, greedy or whatever but the problem with not talking about money is it usually they just don't talk about it at all so like they don't even talk about any part of it and of course it's not super respected i don't think to like brag about how much money you make i mean that part about talking about money maybe doesn't help but like we don't have to like not talk about it at all and i think that's the problem with this whole money is taboo is you see lots of adults. I see it as a financial planner, like all the time people have, you know, said that I'm finishing up training to be a doctor and I'm, you know, in my thirties and I've never really been taught anything about money. That's just a interesting, you know, it's kind of sad that's playing out because it does pe put people at a disadvantage. Absolutely. And again, I always say two things that we have to talk about, whether or not we want to, two things that are going to affect us is health and money. At some point, you might have some health issues. At some point, you might have some money issues. Or regardless, like, you use money, like I said, every single day or some, in some way, you're losing, using money. So you have to know about it. So you need to mm -hmm. understand the psychology behind it, how to use it, how to multiply it. You need to understand those things. And yeah. if you were not exposed to that or talked to about from your parents, you feel, you might feel a little bit lost or even frustrated. Or like Absolutely. you can't talk to anybody about it because no, your parents didn't talk to you about it. So like you just yes. don't talk about it. Yes. But what I have learned is sometimes we don't, our parents don't talk to us about money, but we still see how they handle money. And mm -hmm. then we make our own decision as far as how to handle money when it comes to that time when we have a job. So a lot of time, even though we're not having a direct conversation with our parents about money or we didn't used to have that, we still see, we still pretty much notice how they handle money and mm. we tend to do the same thing. Right. It's like their actions still speak louder than their words, especially if they're not saying anything about it. Yes, absolutely. But sometimes it becomes so secretive. You're like, it's still so, it's so much easier if you just talk about it. Yeah. Because so, for example, in the book, we talk about franchising, we talk about retirement, real estate investing, all those things that you should start talking about early on so that you don't want to be in your 40s and 50s and be like, oh, yes, I need to start thinking about retirement. No, start talking about those things early on. Right. So how did you pay off $250,000 in four years exactly? You said your income was below six figures? So a lot of it was several debt repayment strategies and you know there's they have the debt snowball debt avalanche i use multiple ways to pay off the debt about five ways actually i even refinance there's so many things that i did but the first thing that i had to realize was i had to i had to have a proper mindset and what i mean by that is that i have to go i want to pay off the debt and invest at the same time so i cannot be using my salary to be buying liabilities so i had to be very intentional the first thing was to figure out where my money goes every single month and to reallocate that money towards the debt. Okay, so it's just about organizing my finances pretty much, telling my money where to go. In other words, having a budget, <laughs> the B yeah. word that everybody hates. 
but pretty much telling my money where to go and then from there starting investing. And I was if, if, even able to use some investments to be able to pay up the debt. But what I really did was using my nine to five and then I had a weekend job and then I had the loan repayment program that I was in where they gave me $50,000 towards my student loans. So I had that as well. And then I refinanced. I had a lot going on, a lot of repayment, debt repayment strategies that I had to implement to really pay all that off in four years. So you basically made your mind up you were going to do it, and then you did yes. it by budgeting, managing your money, making it do yes. its thing, essentially. I'm going to say yes and no. Originally, I thought I was going to pay it off in 10 years. That was my plan, 10 years. And then some things happened, a little, let's just say, embarrassing things with money. You know, and I was like, you know what? I have worked way too hard. It's ridiculous for me to have like overdraft freeze or whatever it is. I'm like, let me really get it together, you know? So, and I really, when I really sat down and wrote down my goals and really told my money, this is what I want you to do because I want to have seven streams of income. I want to have a seven figure portfolio. This is what we're gonna, we're gonna do. I was a little late. I was stuck with the money. This is what we're gonna do. So from there, I was like, okay, maybe I can pay it up in seven years. And then once I really started seeing that the debt is just literally reducing and drastically reducing, I was like, I can do it faster than four years. But the plan originally, it was 10 years. That was my plan. Yeah, that's good. Most people set goals that they don't hit. You set a goal and then you got made it even more aggressive. Like, Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> because the thing is that sometimes when you see that it's working, you get energized, you know, and that's for me with working That's why out, the debt snowball works well, as you can Yes, remember. wins. And that's something that I talk to my clients about, celebrate all wins, all wins. Yeah. Well, do you want to explain the debt snowball versus like, you know, the what's the other way of doing it? like interest rate tar targeting or whatever? Mm -hmm. So the debt snowball, that's one way that I did that. So pretty much you look at all of your debt, whether you have student loans, credit card debt, whatever kind of debt that you have, and then you list it from smallest number to largest number, and then you just pay the smallest amount first. Everything that you have, you pay towards the smallest amount. And then you pay that, and then you will, you go to the second smallest, and then to the third smallest. And then pretty much everything pay, gets paid up so quickly. And the reason why is that you get so excited. And... I must say, at first, it might be a little, little bit discouraging because as um, doctors, sometimes we have a $2,000 student loan. So we have different loans, and then we have a $2,000 student loan, and then right next to it is 2.8%. And you have $25,000, and it's like 7.9%. You're like, should they not be looking at the interest rates first? But sometimes when you just pay up that $2,000, you just get excited. You're like, oh, my gosh, let me keep going. Let me keep going. So that's one way that I did to pay off the student loans. Another way is the debt avalanche, which is when we look at the interest rates. So you look at the highest interest rates to the lowest interest rates, and then you attack the debt from highest interest rates to lowest interest rates. And remember earlier I said that I had loan repayment money that I was getting. So $25,000, boom, towards the highest interest rate. Next year, highest interest rate, $25,000, boom, paid up. What was the loan reimbursement program you were in? So I spent two years working at a health center. And for that, they paid me $50,000. Um, like a the, stipend? Yeah. Well, 50, and you have to show that. You have to prove for the to prove, like, okay, I paid $25,000 for student debt. loans. Yeah. Um, and you have the, and I put that something you have to apply for. It's a long, really, like it was very tedious process to be able to get into that program. But that's something that I recommend because it's state-based. So that's something that's worth looking at. But again, it's very important to make sure that you're going to be happy somewhere for two years because some people, they're like, I cannot stay there anymore after like nine months. And then you get into default. You have to pay fees back, penalties. You don't want to get into all that. Yeah. So the debt snowball approach is really good because it's super motivational. So like psychologically, it's a great way to do it. But then like the debt avalanche from a number standpoint makes more sense, but maybe not as motivational because if your highest interest rate debt takes a really long time to pay off, it's kind of like, man, we're not making any progress here. Yes. And for me, I think the only reason why it worked for me is because I had a big chunk of money to put towards it. 
Yeah. You right. may have had twenty five thousand dollars to put towards it for two years. If not, it would have been very discouraging, you know, but with the debt snowball, I'm telling you, for me it's like working out. Sometimes and again, sometimes or some things that we do with money does not always make sense to someone else. It's all about the psychology of money. But when we get those wins, you're like, oh my gosh, I lost five pounds. You know, it's the same thing. So you just keep going. But if you're like, oh my gosh, I've been working, I've been doing this and that, I'm not losing weight. Not seeing any results. So same thing. Again, the death snowball works because you just get into a momentum. You just want to keep going. And if you are working on your mindset at the same time, you'll be amazed. You'll have opportunities or doors open up. You're going to have people bring you jobs, promotions, um, bonuses, whatever it is. It's pretty exciting. Mindset is key. Yeah. I agree. You also mentioned seven streams. How do I get seven streams of income? <laughs> you don't have to get seven streams because that's a lot. I know. And then how do I balance seven streams of income? Because that's, you know, like you said, I'm a saying lot. it's a lot. You don't have to do that. And so a lot of things to one major th thing to understand is that you use your income, your active income, almost like as leverage to be able to have those other streams of income. So a lot of people, they think like, you shouldn't be actively working to have other streams of income. I think whenever you hear passive income, you have to be very careful. You're not like just laying on a beach somewhere, sitting on whatever, margarita or whatever. No, you, act, you have it's not to that actively passive. work. No, you <laughs> have to actively work. And then from there, you can invest in real estate that can give you one income. You can invest in the stock market. You can have another income like that. You can be an author. That's another income. There's so many types of income. And that's the thing. You don't have to be to go chasing um, sev several streams of income. For me, it was recently that I acquired the seven streams of income because I became an author. I didn't have seven before. It was still fine because I was really focusing on rental income, real estate. That was really what was giving me the financial freedom that I have been seeking for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Multiple streams of income. I mean, on the surface, that sounds great, especially passive income sounds great, but I like how you, you know, also mentioned that it is hard work and it's not, I mean, a book doesn't write itself. I imagine that's a lot of work. Yes. Yes. But with that being said, so there, there are a few ways to look at it. I always say one income is way too close to zero. Never have one income. Right. With that being said, don't go chase chasing having a bunch of streams of income. You don't need to have seven streams of income. If it happens, it happens, but you don't have to go chasing. I feel that all doctors should have at least three streams of income. You have your active income, and then you're investing in real estate. That's another income. And then you invest in the stock market. That's another income. But for the stock market, you need to know how to do swing trading so that you can use capital gains as an income, or you have stocks that you invest that you can give you dividend income. Which, are, which is another type of income. Or you can just invest in real estate. There are several ways to just invest in real estate and have multiple paychecks coming your way. Mm -hmm. You don't need to just be a landlord. There are so many ways to invest in real estate that can give you a paycheck every single month or quarterly, depending on the investment. Yep. It's, again, it's to go back to mindset, keep an open mind, because I think a lot of us, when we hear real estate, we're like, I don't want to be a landlord. I don't want to be this, you know? Yeah. Well, I think paying off the debt, what I'm hearing is first thing you did was, well, I guess if, if we go even further back, like in your family, like money was not taboo. And then you got older and you had this big debt and you're like, I'm going to pay this thing off. So you budgeted and you got your con money under control and you paid the thing off really fast. And then you re-diverted that cash flow to investing and building multiple streams of income and whatever, you know, that looks like for you, it varies by person, but you kind of like redirected it to putting your money to work basically. And here you are today. Yes. And that's something that I learned from my parents. Again, talking about money and seeing what they do. My parents never had one income coming in, ever. So they had multiple streams of income, both my mom and my dad. My mom is a physician, a dermatologist. And then my dad was a sociologist, a professor and always have multiple streams of income. They had their own businesses and they were working for the government and also private entities, always. So that's what I did. <laughs> you know, I, always, I never had a one stream of income because right. that's, again, you do what your parents used to do, at least usually you do. So that's what I did. I did what I saw my parents do. And then I realized that, okay, 
they had active income. I need to figure out how to have semi or passive income, in, which is what I use my active income to invest in assets that can give me regular paycheck, regular income, either monthly or quarterly. Yeah. So you've written this book and that, you know, that's an example of an income stream now, but I want to talk a little bit more about like the book and the concept of talking about money with our kids. I think a lot of us as parents were maybe intimidated by that because it's taboo, but then also a lot of people I think are intimidated to bring it up because they don't feel like they know money enough themselves. And so if I'm a parent, I'm like, I get it. Like teach your kids about money. That makes sense. But like, I don't really know where to start. Like, I don't know money myself. And it can be intimidating. And funny you said that one of the parents who bought the book, she said that now she is excited to learn about money herself. Sometimes you just have to learn with your child at the same time. And it's okay to learn together, to learn about investing. Because at first, again, it can be so intimidating. But it's okay to learn those things together. What is investing? What's a 401k? What's an IRA? What's budgeting? What's credit? Why do I need credit? You know, all those things. What is debt? What is the real purpose of debt? So again, I know sometimes it can be a little bit intimidating, but again, it's something that you're going to use every single day. So you don't have a choice pretty much. Right. Yeah, you need to. Either they're going to learn money by your actions, which is kind of like not very much. I mean, it is what it is. Or you can proactively teach them based on like the right way to do it, even if your actions aren't the right way to do it. Like maybe that's the nice thing about teaching your kids. You can kind of like change the trajectory. Like even if you're in a not so well to do family, like you can kind of like give them the power to change their trajectory and get out of that situation. And I mean, it's valuable stuff. Like this is kind of like, should be in schools, right? It should be like first grade education, I, I think. Absolutely. And I still remember when my parents were trying to purchase a car, they would involve us in the conversation about the cost, everything. And again, sometimes when I would talk to my classmates or that later on, you'd be like, oh no, that we don't talk to our kids about that. That's adult stuff. Even if you don't go over many details i still think it's good to start the conversation so they really understand the one plus one plus is two they understand what is that or why what is interest rates you know all those things just to make it easier for them for when they are in college and then they have a bunch of credit card companies say like get my card get my credit card so they know if they should get that card and if they do how much of that credit card they should be using all those things to really help them not to have to struggle or really to understand how they can have financial freedom quickly. I know you've shared some of the takeaways from the book already. I was curious if you could share some of the, either your favorite parts about it or some other areas of like takeaways, like some of the nuggets of wisdom. So there's one where she's, so it's Lily. So Lily, my daughter, my daughter's name is Olivia. We nicknamed her Lily. So the book, pretty much she, I wanted to have a book where she can go back and think about financial freedom and financial literacy. So there's one section where Lily's standing in front of, you see the building there, kind of like the stock market. Remember that little gold? Yeah, so that's what we're trying to depict there, where she's like in front of the stock market, in front of the building, and she's like, you can make money from stocks to investing in trades. So that's something that's very powerful. And then you have the little train there, and she's like, yeah, I'm creating wealth. So all that is really a lot of visualization so that the child can really see like, those are things that I can attract. Those are things that can happen for me. And then we talk about franchising, which is something I didn't even know, even though, yes, I knew it existed. I never really understood it. So we talk about all things that you probably are not really going to talk about on a regular conversation, but you kind of like forced to talk about things that at some point you're going to bump into in your life. So definitely, I love that where she's like standing up all proud in front of you see that i love that it's so <laughs> cute i love this really. yeah no i mean like very few kids have been taught about business franchising or starting business or investing i would say it's a yes. small number i would think and i think the earlier the better and i think with this new generation they want to learn more about those things you know i think they are starting to get curious so i really think again the feedback has been overwhelming really really great as from parents and children, really. What do you think is there? You think the sooner the better? Yes, absolutely. Because those are things that you keep, can keep reiterating. Because they, they say the average is around eight years old when the child pretty much has, 
I don't want to say made up in their mind, but they really understand how the parent is handling money and pretty much that's what they'll do when they're older. And of course, those things can change. They will make their own decisions and stuff like that. But they already have a pretty good idea of how money works through the lens of how their parents have been handling money. So the earlier, the better. Yeah, right. Yeah, I agree. As long, I mean, at the point you start reading books to him is an opportunity. Yes, absolutely. Even if it's like jokingly, you know, but by five years old, definitely start talking about those things. Absolutely. Yeah. And once it's that, when they can understand money, like, okay, this is a quarter, this is a dime, start talking about it. And I like how you talked about like buying the car, like bringing it up in real life scenarios too. What I've found is the more I like talk about it with my kids or have them read books or experience education, they bring it up in life circumstances or they ask what things cost or like they're just curious about money. And then that gives you the opportunity. You don't even really have to bring it up. They bring it up. Wow. See, I love that. Absolutely. And that's the thing. They pay attention. Right. We're just exposing them to it a little bit more. And that's why a book is a fantastic vehicle is you can kind of just start to expose them to it. Yes, I hope that book gets in many, many little hands, many young hands so that they can really read it. It's the the little bedtime story and they can talk to their friends about it. And really, what's really going to help them in the future? Yeah, I love it. Well, I'm curious if there's any other suggestions you have for parents. Are there books that you have read that were inspirational? I have realized there's not a ton of books, unfortunately, for kids. I've been able to find a few people recently that have written books for kids about money, which is kind of cool, but there's not a ton. So I'm curious if you had inspiration from other books or if there's any other tips and tricks you have for parents about breaching the subject. As far as books, I do not. And I think maybe that's what really pushed me to go to my friend and say, like, let's write a book. Because she is, and she has written many children's books. And then one day I was like, you know, I really need to help those doctors, but I wish I could help the young ones. And then I went to her, I was like, I really think we should do this. Or is it possible for us to do this? She's like, yeah, let's do it. But to answer your question, maybe just some exercises with the children. Take them grocery shopping, take them on trips, take them to places where you can really show them how other cultures are even using money. You know, that's one thing. And really, it's so important if you live in the U.S. to understand the purpose of debt, which is, I would say, the purpose of debt is to create wealth. And the sooner your child can understand that, the better. And that it took me a little while to even understand that. But again, the purpose of debt is to create wealth. That's what I have figured out. The purpose of debt is to create wealth, but not to buy more stuff. Yes. And because, you know, we are in a society where we have, quote unquote, stuffitis. Why are we buying stuff? Stuffitis. Like we have stuff, 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 you know? Right. And again, the purpose of debt is to create wealth. So when you think right now, if you have debt and every single month you are not monetizing money, you're not making money from that, you're not getting some interest income, you're not getting some rental income, some kind of income from that, that means someone else is making money from that debt. Again, the purpose of debt is to create wealth. You have to say that a few times to really be like, oh my gosh. So if I have a car loan, if I have a mortgage, if I have furniture debt, if I have credit card debt, someone else is making money. The purpose of debt is to create wealth. They're creating wealth from this. For someone, but if it's, odds are it's not for you. Exactly. That means someone else is making the wealth, not you. Yeah, because there's a reason that they issued you the debt and they're not just giving away free money. No, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) So write it down somewhere. The purpose of debt is to create wealth. If you have debt right now and you're not making money from that debt, which is pretty much all. Yeah. So that means that someone else is making the money. Someone else is creating wealth. And when I realized that, I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) I'm getting rid of this debt. (laughs) Yeah. No, seriously. Yes. Because at that time I had 7.9% of my student loans. That's a lot. Yeah. That was creating a lot of wealth for someone. (laughs) Exactly. And that's what happened to go back a little bit. What really pushed me to even want to pay it up fast is, so two things made me want to pay it up fast. My parents put that in my head, trying not to owe people money. That's how they raised me and my sister, trying Mm -hmm. not to owe people money. Because remember, I'm from the Caribbean. Everything was cash. Till this day, my mom mom doesn't have a credit card. Yeah, I'm sure she doesn't. (laughs) But anyway, (laughs) the second thing is 
I was meeting with a financial advisor because it's part of the exit counseling at Tufts. I don't know if they still have that, but I was meeting with the financial advisor. I think it's a financial advisor. But anyway, and then she was showing me a bunch of numbers. And then now remember, she showed me $520,000, which will be how much I will have to pay if I were to take 25 years to pay up the debt. That's when I was like, okay. So two hundred fifty thousand ends up being five hundred and something. Yes, dollars. in twenty five yeah. years, I was like, you know what? It's, I'm I'm good. She said, yeah, and I'm sure she gave me some good financial advice after she showed me the number. But after she said that, I could literally feel the cold sweats. I got nervous. I got more anxious. I'm like, no, this is not happening. I need to get rid of this debt right now. So that's what I did four years later, and it's the best thing ever. There's not one day where I'm like, I wish I still had that. Who says yeah. that? I never said that. People always ask us if they should pay off their mortgage early or pay off the debt faster. And my favorite response to him is that like, I've never really come across someone that has completed paying off their debt and regrets it. And again, remember, we live in the US, but it's so easy to go with that. But people sometimes worry about paying off debt. It's pretty common. So it's like, well, I can understand that, but like, I've never seen talk to anyone that regretted paying off their debt. Like everybody that I have encountered after they have paid, just like you, like they're pumped about it. They're like, this was fantastic. Uh, it feels great. It's the most freeing thing I've ever, ever done. It's the best thing I've ever done for myself. And with that, I met my husband shortly after. And I knew exactly how to pay it up quickly, the debt that he had. And then we got married debt-free. We paid up the wedding rent. I think it was the best thing ever. It's the best thing ever, really. Again, like I say, we never ever say like, oh, we should go into bed. We should like, we miss that. We miss being in Yeah, bed. right. You don't miss it either. That's the other thing. You don't no. miss that. Like nobody misses that. No. And again, like I said, you live in the US where it's so easy to go back in, into that. Like every day I still get like emails or all the time credit card companies like you can pre qualified i'm like i need to apply for it you're qualified yeah. you're pre-approved i'm like oh what i'm good <laughs> i'm my own bag i'm my own atm i'm good yeah yeah well you're doing it doing it the right way i like it's good to hear and you're passing it on too so you're teaching other people and then teaching the kids is the best part that's my favorite that's just yes i mean i definitely chose the I guess I call it the, the, or they call it the road less travel because most people don't take that road. They don't take their debt freedom road. Usually, no. Because I'm, I must say, when we graduate from medical, dental school, pharmacy school, whatever it is, we have six figure debt. We just want to be doctor. We just want to live like a doctor. And again, I have no regrets that I kind of de delayed the doc itis. <laughs> You know, like living like a doctor and I have no regrets. Oh my gosh. It's the best thing ever. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult to reduce lifestyle too. Like you got to nip that on the front end if possible. Like, yes. And that's the thing. Some people, they might think like I was eating bread. What is it called? Bread beans and rice or noodles. Ramen noodles. No, <laughs> no I wasn't doing that. And even in the year. So that's the thing. So I put it was a big thing to celebrate um, graduation. I didn't do anything. But the year after, I spent a whole month in Europe. So just to tell you, and I still, I was still able to pay off the debt in a pretty good amount of time. So 250000 in four years. And I still spent a month in Europe. You know, you just have to tell your money where to go. You just have to be the CEO of your finances, tell your money where to go. And I mean, you see me, I'm smiling because it's the best thing ever. Yeah. It's int intentionality is what it is. And like in the world we live in today, the way it's set up is it's so like easy and automatic. Like you got Amazon one click, you got credit card swipes, you got automatic pay, everything. So like everybody, I mean, my grandparents used to balance their checkbook. So they would like yes. write the numbers down, which was a little bit more aware, but now it's like, you can basically just earn a paycheck and it disappears every month and there's zero intentionality in it. Yes, but what you're yes. talking about is intentionality. Like you yes. are the boss of your money. Like you controlled yes, it. Yes, absolutely. 
because the other way around is not fun. No, like every single month you have to pay your student loan service. So you have to pay credit card, you have to pay the mortgage, you have to pay this, you pay that. No, it's, I would rather you put that money towards investment or towards assets that can give you income and then having to take 25 or 30 years to just be in debt or, and that's the thing too, sometimes they just, when I say they, meaning um, student loan servicers or creditors, they make it look affordable. Like if you go and get a car or furniture, whatever it is, they're like, oh, it's just 300 a month or 700 a month. And you just get it. You're like, yeah, I can afford that. You make it part of your budget. But I'm like, again, you're making someone richer. The purpose of that is to create wealth. They are getting wealthy from you giving them monthly payments plus interest mm-hmm. when you could be making that money. Yep. And it's a sneaky little car. Like it adds up. And Yes. I'm telling you, when I saw how much I would end up paying in 25 years, I said, no. Your switch was flipped when you saw the interest, total interest. Cost. Yes, absolutely. That's a lot. And that's when I refinanced. That was one strategy that I used was refinancing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could could you be swayed by a 0% interest credit card? <laughs> I would still pay it off every year, every month. Yeah. That's, you know, there's I no free have, lunch. Like at the end of the day, there's always a cost. So a lot of these companies offer zero yes. percent interest rates on debt or whatever. But like, there's some costs there. It's just, and stuff happened. One time, I had a client. Actually, he wasn't a client. So he was trying to become one of my clients. And then one time, he sent me a message. He said, "I should have I'm listened to you because now I'm in eight thousand dollars student on credit card debt." with a zero percent meaning he just kept putting Getting everything more, yeah swipe because it's so easy to swipe here's the color it's, it's so easy eight thousand and yeah. it might not be that easy for some people to pay eight thousand dollars like that so it becomes a balance you know even though it's zero percent then you keep adding up stuff happen then yeah it can yep. become messy so. that is dangerous yeah it is i agree if you don't understand the purpose of that or the psychology of money it's going to delay the process of financial freedom. Yep. I agree. Couldn't agree more. Well, I, I enjoy talking about this stuff. It's fun for me. And I'm glad I found, I can tell you enjoy money too, which is we can geek out about money together. It's a fun topic. It is. It's good. And I think teaching your kids about it and learning these basic principles yourself, even if you're learning alongside your kids, that's such a valuable thing you can do. And you don't like, none of us are perfect. Like we're not going to, figure it out all overnight. It's a work in progress. And I like that you can kind of use that approach of like learning alongside your kids. That's just a great way to look at it, like you said. And I appreciate you chatting with me. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun. Well, we'll look forward to catching up again another time. Thank you again for having me. Yeah, definitely.